Greetings, I'm Rob Redden. And if this is the first time that you have found this uh, video, I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to this and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be a regular listener or viewer, whatever word you wanna to use to describe that. I happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ in Grover Beach, California. And I've served this congregation for over 40 years. And I never tire from sharing the word of God and my discoveries, I can't keep them a secret. I wanna share with others the precious truths that I've found in God's holy word. And every day I find something amazing in God's word. It's a mind that continues giving up its treasures. A couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I talked about building an inquisitive mind. And I've been thinking about that lesson for quite some time. And I would like to expand on, upon that and uh, share with you some more insights that I have, get, uh, have obtained. And hopefully it will uh, help you out. I referred to Exodus chapter 3, where... Moses was shepherding in the wilderness, not too far from Mount Sinai, to be exact. He was the, he was the father-in-law of Jethro, and he had escaped Egypt and was a fugitive because he killed a, a, an Egyptian protecting a fellow Israelite. And so he fled the country for his life. And for 40 years, he had been in this area serving his father-in-law and uh, shepherding the flocks. And as you recall, one day while he was doing this, he looked out and saw a burning bush. And we mentioned in the other lesson that his first impression may have been, well, maybe there was a lightning storm and I didn't notice it and it hit that bush and set it afire. Or perhaps there was a traveler that accidentally set it afire from a campfire. But as he continued looking at this site, he discovered that while it was burning, it was not being consumed. So his curiosity was increased by this event. And he says, I will go and check this out. And so he went and God spoke out of the bush and called him to be his servant in leading his people, the Israelites, out of bondage. The Hebrew tense here suggests a cohortative sense, which indicates there was some self-talk going on. He says, let me go see, let me go see. Self-talk is very important in developing an inquisitive mind. We'll talk about that a little later. And so it's very important for us, I think, to enhance our curiosity about important matters. What if Moses had just said, oh, well, uh, a bush is burning and turned around and busied himself with his duties and never even looked at it again? No, but his curiosity led to one of the greatest experiences of humanity. God chose him. And God appealed to his inquisitiveness. And he does to us, he, he will do that for us today as well. Not from a burning bush, but something as fantastic because it can change our lives to serve the Lord rather than ourselves. And so enhancing our curiosity about important matters matters. But you know what? It's fruitless to try to teach those who are not curious. But it can be cultivated. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Jesus stimulates curiosity. Jesus told a parable about a pearl merchant who was looking for the pearl of great price. 
a priceless pearl, and he found it. And it was available. And he sold everything that he had to purchase this priceless pearl. Matthew 13, 45 through 46. That story was told by Jesus to enhance our curiosity, our inquisitiveness about the kingdom of God and that we should seek it as a man seeks a pearl of great price. And that requires attentiveness to spiritual matters. But our life is so filled with the material things, the day-to-day -day things, the responsibilities, the challenges, the difficulties, the distractions, as well as escape through entertainment and va vacations. You know, the cell phone can be a wonderful thing. You can find knowledge that you would have to go to the library and you'd be very fortunate if you find all that knowledge in a library, especially in a small city. But on the other hand, people play games all day long on the cell phone. They chat with friends and they spend time on the social networks, the social media, and that consumes their attention. And it takes away from curiosity and inquisitiveness about life. You know, by the way, if you want to read the story about the parable of the pearl, is in Matthew 13, 45 and 46. And while you're there, you might as well uh, read the whole chapter because it's a chapter of parables with regard to the kingdom. You know, I decided to do a little research into all the words used in the New Testament for seek. I was really surprised that there are around a dozen different words, and each has a subtle but valuable nuance that fits our lesson on enhancing our inquisitive mind. I will only give you the lexicon's description of these nuances rather than burden you with uh, the Greek words. Try to learn something by careful investigation or searching. Exert considerable effort and care in learning something. Exert effort in continuing to acquire information regarding some matter with the implication as to how to respond appropriately. To engage in careful search in order to acquire information, primarily inquiry to make an extensive effort to learn the details and truth about something, to make an effort despite difficulties to come to know something when the chances of success in such an enterprise are not particularly great, to try to learn the location of something, to try to learn the location of an object by diligently following after or tracking down, to learn, learn the nature or truth of something by the process of careful study, evaluation, and judgment. To learn, to try to learn the genuineness of something by examination and testing, often through actual use. To try to learn the nature or character of something or someone by submitting such through extensive testing. Now, to sum up this in a nice package, we discover God expects us to be inquisitive and curious to make a continuous effort to learn the truth by acquiring knowledge by careful research, despite how difficult it is with the intent to respond as God would have us to respond, but to discover by living it that God's will is that which is good, acceptable, and perfect because God is holy and sovereign, the sovereign Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2. All those words are constantly thrown at us from Scripture with these nuances that basically suggest without an inquisitive mind, without a curiosity spirit, we're not going 
to get close to God, nor will we discover his will, nor will we reach heaven, plain and simple. You know, I mentioned this before in a previous lesson, but I've got other things to say. The way we nurture our inquisitive minds about God is to be infatuated with nature. God's fingerprint is all over creation. Robertson Crusoe found footsteps on that deserted island that he thought was deserted. And he was shipwrecked and stranded there. And when he found footprints on the beach, he knew he was not alone. And God's footprint, his fingerprint is all over creation. And it tells us that we are not alone. We don't have to be scientists to be fascinated with nature. I read a story about tourists taking a train over the Alps, which is the highest and most extensive mountain range in Europe. They were ooing and aahing at the majestic peaks and marvelous beauty. Then the wife nodded to him and to look at the woman sitting, reading her book. The man was curious about this and rudely interrupted her from her reading and asked her, how can you read a book when you are surrounded by all this beauty? She replied, I take this train often. I've seen it many times. And she turned her attention back to the book. Jaded is the word that comes to mind. Familiarity breeds contempt is a popular cliche. Too often it is the truth. A lecherous man may leave his beautiful wife for a cheap, unattractive prostitute. Are we so jaded that God's creation does not excite us to want to know more? And Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. When we see a masterpiece of craftsmanship, we think about the craftsman, the craftsman who created this. I remember a number, a number of years ago, I went into the St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, and the architecture just astounded me. When we realize how many centuries ago that was built, and yet the craftsmanship without the modern tools that are used, the electrical powered tools that are used today. And to realize that the gift to create that was available then is just outstanding. A testimony of the creator, the building of the Egyptian pyramids. We think the ancients were sort of ignorant and illiterate and, and not too smart. But they understood geography. They understood how, pardon me, geometry. They understood how to put together a, a pyramid out of huge rocks that weighed tons, shaped into blocks. Doesn't creation tell us something about God, something we want to know? Have we focused our attention on things and failed to see God's hand in everything good? You know, generalization has led many to atheism because all they see is the evil in the world and blame God for it. I don't know if I mentioned this, but a salesman went to New York City on a business trip for the first time and he traveled by cab to about half a dozen meetings. When he returned, his fellow workers asked him what he thought of New York. He responded, New York is a fine city. But the taxicab drivers are a bunch of burly, cigar stinking, rude men. Now, there are over 13,000 legal cab drivers in New York City. 
Can you judge 13,000 by six drivers? He did, but he followed the logical fallacy of generalization. Now, how would you respond to the question of an atheist, how can you Christians believe in God with all the evil in the world? My response, how can you not believe in God with all the good that is in the world? There are so much good that is being done in the world that doesn't get the press because that does not sell. Now, I'm not recommending the religion, but the Christian Science uh, News reporter reports positive and good news. But that's only one publication. Where are others? Seldom do you read something positive in the paper. And when you do, you're quite surprised, and it's usually not on the front page. It's the tragedies, it's the heartaches, it's the horrible things that have happened in this country and the world. I will grant you that there is horrible evil in this world, but granting for the sake of argument that God does not exist, how could there be good in all the world? It would be hell here on earth. And the evil in the world tells us more about ourselves and the good in the world tells us about God. But they could respond, but there are natural disasters that kill innocent people. My response, so a holy God should just overlook all the evil in the world and let everyone live here forever on earth? Why can't you see how the evil that men do causes the innocent to suffer and that natural catastrophes can be traced back to the evil introduced in this world by man? This is a fallen world because of sin. It wasn't designed this way by God. And God created us with free will, and the misuse of that led to the mortality of man, which includes every way imaginable to end human life, which is the price of life itself. You know, we need to be more inquisitive about our God, his holiness and his justice, his sovereignty and his love. And what steps... He's taken to provide eternal bliss after this short life is over. Biblically, we find all the answers we need. We must start with Jesus, for he said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 14, 9. <clears throat> for us to see the Father, we must know the Son. Hebrews 1 and 3, part A. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation representation of his nature. In Philippians 3 and verse 10, Paul aspires to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Do we have an inquisitive mind to discover what we can about our God and Lord Jesus Christ? But again, we must nurture our inquisitive minds concerning God's will. The German philosopher uh, Gotthold Lessing, who lived in the 1700s, stated, If God came to me and offered me the gift of all knowledge or the quest for truth with all the struggles, heartaches, and trials, I would choose the latter, not the finished product. Inquisitive minds. You know, I'm very thankful that God gave me the opportunity to obtain the tools for in-depth research into his word. And I do not believe it is an easier road than becoming a medical doctor. I'm sure that most have traveled down that road would agree it's one of the hardest things to do. Yet the learning was enriching beyond words. And without inquisitiveness, without curiosity, without a love and a quest for learning, I would not be here talking to you today. You know, the whole purpose of continued education is to be a teacher and preacher of God's word and impart the will of God to others accurately and effectively as much as we can with the help of God. Here's a verse that I think is relevant to our study, John 7, 17. 
if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Notice God's will is something that is hidden from those who are rebellious and disinterested. It is made known to those who have a quest to do his will. This requires an inquisitive mind. I had a lunch with a brother the other day, a brother in Christ, and it was the first time that I met him. And he was a third generation member of the church. In other words, both grandparents and parents were members of the Church of Christ. His grandfather was initially a Catholic. And when he was 18, he began reading the Bible. He was curious. He didn't get much Bible from attending his church. He read it through three times. Then he asked to see the priest, and a meeting was set up. And he told them that they were teaching error and needed to change. Obviously, being somewhat naive, he was hoping to make a difference being 18 years old. Well, he was informed that he was no longer permitted to enter the church building. Well, the next day he saw the Church of Christ and went and studied with a preacher and was baptized. And that began several generations of Christians in that family. Did I tell you about a prominent preacher in our fellowship, J.J. Turner and his wife. When they got married, they weren't church-going people. So they decided to read the Bible together. After finishing the New Testament, they decided to visit some churches in the area to see if they could find a church that was similar to the one they found in the New Testament. Time and again, they were went away disappointed and discouraged. Finally, they found a church of Christ and decided to visit. After they left, they looked at each other and said, I think we've found the New Testament church. Heaven only knows the good this couple has done for the Lord's church without an inquisitive mind. They could have even been lost. You know, Luke records the work of Paul at Berea. This was just a few miles from Thessalonica. And in Acts 17, 11, Luke records, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Notice, noble-minded means more open-minded, without prejudice. They received Paul's teaching with great eagerness, however, they examined the scriptures, the Old Testament determined for themselves if they were being taught the truth. This should be the desire of every sound teacher and gospel preacher. Don't take my word for it, but at least examine the things said in the light of Scripture. So God's will requires a desire to search and discover his will for our lives. Some just study it to debate with others or to prove others wrong. We must have an inquisitive mind to seek God's will for ourselves. We need to struggle in study, in prayer. We need to learn to use the tools available like Strong's Exhaustive Concordance that has blessed millions of people. You know, another thing we need to nurture is our inquisitiveness about others. Of course, there's a difference between being nosy and being interested in others. And I mentioned that we've got to respect the boundaries of other people. I remember a group of Christians were meeting at a member's home 
they had just rented the place and one of the ladies of the congregation in front of everybody said, well, how much do you pay for rent? That's not being just inquisitive. That's being nosy. There is a difference. And I recommended the book by Larry King, How to Talk to Anyone, Anytime, Anywhere. Although he was not a Christian, he was one of the most successful interviewers the world has ever seen. And this book is priceless to help a Christian talk to other people and get acquainted and learn more about the individual and their needs and where they are with, with the Lord. <clears throat> Do we have a love for others, even those with whom we disagree? Our words must be seasoned with salt, Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how to respond to each person. You know, Job complained about food without salt or the white of an egg in Job 6 and verse 6. And you know, many fall away without ever wondering what happened. And if they are curious, many will ask the preacher what happened to them. Do not all who are spiritual have an obligation to restore those overcome in sin? Galatians 6 1. Paul wrote, Brethren, if any of you is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Obviously, this trespass has come to light, not by someone catching the brother or sister in the act. That's not what Paul meant by the word caught found in the New American Standard. Overtaken or overcome is a better rendering. The idea is being caught unawares, surprised. Many are, who are overwhelmed by something they can't believe that they could have done takes that deep spiritual spiral downward in a very dark place. It takes a deeply spiritual person to assist them in a gentle spirit, which is the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5 and verse 23. A person motivated by just curiosity will want to know all the sordid details about the trespass committed. But a genuine inquisitive person is moved by love and not a nosy interest. A person lacking in spirituality may be easily swayed by the fallen brother's complaint. So I think it's very important for us to realize that we should be inquisitive about the state, the spiritual state of others, and connect with people to show them our love and appreciation for them and their needs. Finally, we need a healthy, vital, inquisitive mind about ourselves. Know thyself is an ancient aphorism. It was the first of three Delphic maxims inscribed in the forecourt of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. And Plato's famous maximum was, the unexamined life is not worth living. I memorized that Greek expression, ha anexotasos bios u biontas anthropo. The unexamined life is not worth living. So this is counsel from non-Christians who were considered among the wisest who ever lived. Yet how many people really know themselves? How many look at the mirror and ask themselves, can I become a better person today than I was yesterday? In our culture, our society is taught not to second guess yourself, but embrace your uniqueness even if people don't like you. Be yourself. Individuality is something to be welcomed and expressed. We're not suggesting denying our individuality, but if by that people mean embrace your sinful attitudes and practices and habits, then let's use another word for that. Character. Why is self-talk so important? Well, researchers have found that positive self-talk can help immensely with work performance, learning, self-awareness, and managing anxiety. 
Positive self-talk reframes the way we look at stressful situations and how we can approach them. Going from, this is too difficult, to, I can do this. Don't say anything to yourself that you wouldn't say to anyone else. End of quote. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this among yourselves, that Christ is in you unless you indeed fail the test? You see, Christ is our model, and he requires total honesty and an inquiring mind about ourselves. Six times the Greek expression translated, do not be deceived, occurs in the New Testament. One of the tools in Satan's tool chest is to convince us that we are doing a fine job and nothing is amiss in our lives. And let me suggest Dr. Neil Burton's book, Hide and Seek, The Psychology of Self-Deception. He identifies 38 defense mechanisms that we use to make us feel good about ourselves while we deny reality and we lie to ourselves. How often do people play the victim card and blame game to excuse their sinful behavior? It began in the garden and it continues today. I just want us to be serious about examining ourselves to see what needs work. We all have our besetting sins, according to the author of Hebrews 12 and verse 1, but it also tells us to put them off. And we've got to know what they are to get rid of them. So in conclusion, insight into God's creation, his nature in scripture, the discovery of God's will, our insights into human nature, and especially our own nature, come to us beginning with an inquisitive mind. We can nurture this quality if we really want to. Do we hunger for God's word like food and drink? I hope so. The lesson is yours. Let's pray. Father in heaven, stimulate within us a thirst a hunger, a desire to know things we don't know from your holy word. For we know, dear God, that the more we know, the more we can perfect our lives before you in our service, in our thoughts, in our lives. Help us, dear God, to cultivate that inquisitive mind that we not miss the things that you are drawing us to your attention and be like Moses. Let me see what this is all about. Help us, dear God, to have that quest for truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I want to thank you for listening. I may have repeated myself from the first lesson, but there were a lot of things I had to say, a lot more than I did that day. I want to invite you to the Church of Christ near you, if you're in our neighborhood in Grover Beach, California, we would urge you to come and visit us at 202 South 8th Street in Grover Beach. Our services are Bible class at 10 and worship at 11 o'clock. We hope to see you. And until we meet again, God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Goodbye.